Great. So, uh, as usual, I'm having the pandemic uh, the difficulties with my with with my uh, microphone, and uh, 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 but I appreciate everyone coming um, at this first in what we intend to be an ongoing series uh, about uh, HLS grads doing interesting work in teaching. So. Um, the we hope to have some topic specific uh, uh, panels as well as panels on things like starting a new program or developing a new seminar. Um, and basically, the idea is that our graduates are an incredible resource. We have so many graduates in, in teaching, um, and there are things that we can now do because technology allows it to create a greater community and share some of the learning uh, that we have done. Um, and in particular, uh, I think this is motivated by the fact that like many uh, postgraduate and graduate instructors, um, we focused in becoming uh, educators on our su subject matter expertise and did not uh, actually have specific targeted instruction in how to teach, even though pedagogy is itself a discipline. Um, and so uh, this is one attempt to kind of fill some of the gaps uh, that may have existed because we were expected to learn how to teach by osmosis. Uh, and as we've learned about the sub substantive subject matter, um, osmosis is a good way to teach some students, but it leaves a lot of people out. Uh, and the more that you can articulate uh, what you are actually doing, both substantively and pedagogically, the more people you can bring along with you. So uh, I'm delighted uh, to have as the beginning of this, uh, three people who are doing really interesting uh, work in teaching and have some special things to say about coming back from um, the pandemic and what, uh, what we might take away from what we learned during the pandemic. So I'm gonna give very brief introductions. Um, the the uh, panelists are far more accomplished than I have time to say, um, but I do wanna get to their comments. Um, Danielle Donfro is an associate professor of law at Washington University School of Law. Uh, her research uses economic and historical analysis of private law to theorize emerging assets. Uh, professor Donfro teaches property, advanced private law, and corporations. And in, in this year, she was awarded the David M. Becker Professor of the Year Award, that is the Student Award for Teaching. Uh, Sharon Jacobs is a professor of law at Berkeley. Uh, she teaches and writes in the areas of energy law, environmental law, and administrative law. She was also a Clemenco Fellow and lecturer uh, at, uh, at Harvard uh, before going on the full-time teaching market, uh, which I have to say because uh, it is promotional. Uh, before she attended law school, Professor Jacobs was a professional uh, cellist. Uh, 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 cellist. Mm. Excuse me. She holds a master's degree from Juilliard and a bachelor's degree from the Cleveland Institute of Music. Uh, Portia Pedro is an associate professor at Boston University School of Law. Her research is in uh, civil procedure, remedies, and federal courts, um, and she studies the ways in which racial subordination and subordination of other marginalized groups is embedded in civil procedure, remedies, and federal courts. So we have a broad area of topic expertise um, to, to, that I think will actually strengthen the discussion of pedagogical techniques. So if it's all right with everyone, um, I would like to get some opening remarks. I'll just go in alphabetical order, uh, and then perhaps we can have a conversation and ask, que and ask for questions from the attendees. So uh, Danielle, will you get us started with uh, what you are bringing back from pandemic teaching? I am muted. That was a, <laughs> I would have hoped that I would have learned my lesson after all of the Zoom teaching. Uh, so I was very lucky that we had some teaching support uh, led by our psychology and brain science department just to get us all up to speed kind of quickly on how people actually learn as we uh, all had to redesign our classes in the pandemic. And that made me think about adding a lot of uh, what I guess gets called in pedagogy is scaffolding to my class. So trying to be very explicit about what I am teaching. And so what I did is I started to make kind of programs for each class. And this was labor intensive upfront, although now in year three of using them, uh, I find it labor reducing on the back end. But so students uh, had a handout that they could use at home when they were on Zoom to follow along and recognizing that they were, many of them were in like high distraction environments. And so if their attention got drawn away for a minute in the classroom, 
what could I give them so that they could come back and participate to the fullest? Um, and so I, it, these have sort of evolved into having a, a guide to the reading at home and then what to expect in class. And I use this to um, key students to the vocabulary I'm trying to teach them because I teach, I always teach first semester 1Ls property law. And there's just a whole lot of new vocabulary there. And then I created a master list of, of like core concepts for the class. And I try to use them uh, a bit like hashtags in the class where I say like, you know, these are the four themes you'll see in today's reading and our discussion. Um, and they can add them to their notes and sort of cue very new students into uh, what to expect and then what to how to draw connections in the class over the term. Um, I will say it was a lot of extra upfront work, uh, but then I noticed that it narrowed the gap in my class a bit, so made my tails a bit shorter, and I was happy to see that. Um, and in general, I have, I have found that, although I often feel like I'm sort of spoon-feeding students, uh, that they appreciate that, and it makes the discussions actually more interesting if I've cued students to sort of the very foundational and basic stuff that they will need to know and expect less that they'll just get that out of some cases that might've been written a long time ago. Uh, great, thanks. And you've already uh, generated a bunch of questions which I'm gonna pose to the group. Um, Sharon, uh, would you be willing to go next? Of course. So um, thanks so much for having me and thanks for putting on this this series. It's nice to be a part of it. I spent my pandemic actually at the University of Colorado, where I was immediately prior to joining the faculty at Berkeley this summer. And um, so we experienced both remote learning um, and a semester of hybrid learning, which I found even more challenging than remote instruction, uh, if at all possible. And I guess what I'd like to say in my opening remarks, um, I'd like to organize them around two ideas about connection. Um, and so the first obviously relates to technology. I think we found new technical ways to connect with students remotely during the pandemic. And that was of course, Zoom uh, and other electronic means of communication. And so there's been a lot of thinking since um, the pandemic, I suppose, ended, right? Or since we got back into the classroom about how we can use those new technologies moving forward. And I have found those to be tremendously useful, especially Zoom um, for bringing remote guests into my classroom. That's something that I like to do, especially in my um, energy law class and environmental law classes. And so that's enabled us to cover distances we wouldn't have been able to cover before. We just had uh, the, the general counsel and an attorney from the Hawaii Public Utilities Commission join my class virtually uh, for a discussion that went very smoothly because of the technology we now have. And we were able as a result to learn about some of the really innovative things that Hawaii is doing when it comes to electric rate making. Um, so I've tried to work those visitors in. Zoom has also been useful for things like office hours for students who can't get in for whatever reason. So there's the technological aspect of connection, but the other aspect of connection I really wanna emphasize is interpersonal connection and just our basic human connection with our students, which I think you know, some of us, and, and I'll speak for myself here, but as a, a younger woman in law teaching, I often felt the need to put up um, a, a very professional veneer with my students, especially at the beginning, um, but really throughout my eight years in academia um, so far. And um, I found that during the pandemic, I just wasn't able to maintain that in the same way because my child was running into the frame and my students had children and pets that were running into the frame and I was hearing their stories about, um, you know, they couldn't get to their coursework because they had uh, a, a death in the family or a relative who was ill with COVID or they, you know, lost their job and their housing was threatened and um, we became part of each other's lives in a slightly more intimate way and nothing fell apart. As a result of that, I was still able to, to sort of maintain respect in the classroom, um, and I think the respect really went both ways. And so for me, even beyond the technology, it was this interpersonal connection that I carry with me out of the pandemic um, or out of the acute phase of the pandemic and back into the classroom where I think I, you know, I, I see my students in a more fully human light um, and understand their struggles and make even more efforts to kind of accommodate those and ensure that they can be 
a full part of the learning experience, whatever, um, whatever that means. So maybe I'll leave it there for now and I look forward to our conversation. Great, thank you. Um, Portia, uh, will, you will you round out the introductions? And I've been told my I can't start my own video. Oh no, okay, let me see if I can uh, change that. Uh, give me one second, I'm sorry. There we go, okay, perfect. Um, so for, for me, I, I've seen a, a number of the same things as um, the others have already mentioned. And I, I think I'll, we'll see if this ends up being two main things, I'm not sure of the number. Um, one thing has definitely been access that has, has changed in terms of what I'm doing um, during the pandemic and the things that I'm, that I'm keeping the same um, uh, from now on. Uh, and I think it's increased access um, that we thought about uh, and focused on because it needed to happen during the pandemic that I realized students just need it all the time or really benefit from it. So some of those things, um, uh, that, that I didn't do before, recording every class um, so that it's available. Um, now, I think there's decisions as to whether or not to make that available to every student. I tend to have students um, because I'm teaching first and everyone else who, with unfettered access, there would be a few students who would just rewatch classes several times. Um, I've had a number of students who've said that they started looking up every case that was cited and reading it. So I'm, I'm a little hesitant to give access to the recordings to all students from the beginning, but to have every class recorded is something that I think increases access in a way that we never thought about it in case something happens during class unexpectedly, et cetera, to have students be able to, to watch that later. Um, something else that, that works in, in, in terms of access for after. I've heard such interesting things, um, and it's something that has not come up for me yet, about people choosing to make really difficult topics hybrid for students and emphasizing that students can be remote during those classes for, for people teaching, especially um, things that in, involve uh, sexual assault or something of that nature. It can mean that one of my, one of my um, uh, colleagues at another school mentioned that, um, that, that they went from having many of the women not attend that class at all, which was optional um, before the pandemic, to having people participate, um, but participate remotely so that people could decide if they needed to step away. They didn't have to be there in person um, and risk going through those things, but they also didn't have to miss out on the class or only watch it later. They could choose what their level of, of readiness for participation was. Um, uh, I, I think typing and access to, to laptops is something that I thought about differently after um, uh, going through the pandemic in a way um, that, that I would hope others would too. Uh, and I, I think some of the other things that, that still deal with access, um, I think that is a bulk of them. Uh, medical situations, I think talking about them in a different way so the number of students who I've had who, uh, because maybe in part because of uh, changes with uh, the pandemic and including a basic need statement on my syllabus, who told me about something um, that uh, let me say, oh, that is actually a medical reason to be excused from class, who actually before the pandemic, I think those students just didn't tell me that anything was happening. So one student had a contact stuck in their eye for over, you know, whatever amount of time and needed to leave um, during an extended class to go to get it taken out of their eye. Um, and I think without some of the, the, um, the accessibility to classes, but also um, some of the, if you have a medical issue, make sure to bring it up. I don't know that those students would have brought it up or would have thought they needed to use a pass instead of it being a medical excuse. So having some of those um, flexibility, I think really matters. And I, I think that'll also go to um, the, the second thing that I was thinking about in terms of what I've seen is that there are different needs of students. And it seems to me that some of them students are being more clear about in a very helpful way um, and others, 
they are just trying to get through it. Um, and I, I say that because I, I didn't teach civil procedure or any of my 1L, uh, any other 1L class um, uh, in the height of when people were doing remote and hybrid. So I can see kind of a before and now. And um, it actually resulted in students not coming to office hours as much. I think their ideas of what interaction they should be having in person um, was limited to like essential or required, right? It was kind of, we're trying to limit the, the time that we take um, from each other. And so uh, is, is, was their idea, I think what was, what was happening. And because I realized it, because I, I had many fewer students come to office hours, but I would have students you know, every few days, another student would say, I'm so confused, I'm so lost. And I realized, so they're lost, but they're not coming to office hours. Um, and so I, I sent out an email at uh, 11 o'clock p.m. one night saying, feeling lost, confused, like you don't get it, I've got something for you. Email me if you're interested. Um, and more than half the class emailed me when I told them I was gonna have a special session where we could talk about concepts that weren't from that day, concepts from weeks ago, um, and that I could talk without them having specific questions. And I could talk just on certain topics. Like 90% of my class wanted to come and they wanted to do it weekly. And so understanding, and so I, I told them, so you understand this is office hours, right? Office hours can be me talking about something. Office hours can be about something three weeks ago. Office hours can be for a person who's confused and doesn't even know exactly what they're confused about. It just wants to listen. It. But so now I'm holding these special sessions um, in, in lieu of one of my office hour sessions once a week to, to try to help students get in. I, I think uh, uh, going along with what I think um, Danielle was talking about in terms of spoon feeding, it can feel different because I am in those sessions walking through things, just walking through the tests and the common pitfalls and um, uh, and instead of what I do in class and with the reading of trying to help them discern where the things are, I'm telling them what they are, what I think they are, and very much connecting it to practice and um, exams. And they like it. And for me, I don't have a problem with doing it because it's the same thing I would do in a review session anyway. I just think that they are wanting um, and benefiting from review sessions basically almost weekly instead of getting that in an office hour setting. Um, and I think that the, the last thing that, that I'll say on this that I think has, um, I, that I'm taking is during the, the height of being remote and all of that, there was this type of in case of emergencies plan. And um, so the idea was at least that we were encouraged to uh, say what the class should do if an instructor's uh, Wi-Fi cut out. And from that, that has made me realize that um, it's helpful for them to know what to do in different types of emergencies, shortly before class, in class, after class, because many of these students uh, are thinking that they shouldn't step away from the class no matter what, um, because the pandemic uh, empathy is, is, is gone in some kind of way. So the idea that, oh, you might need to step away from your screen, you might need to do that. People were saying those things a lot. You might feel ill if you have any symptoms, don't do X, Y, or Z. People were saying those things much more before and because we aren't saying them in the same way now, many students are risking on going through extremely unbelievably difficult personal medical health circumstances without knowing what to do. And so even needing to take the time to tell my students, there might be something that comes up in class, you could have a medical emergency. And if you do, handle what you need to handle. You do not have to first take notes and X, Y, and Z and apologize to me, right? Um, that that uh, if people have a medical emergency or some type of emergency right before, during, et cetera, or after class, you can do what you need to do to handle the situation and communicate with me or with student affairs or, or whoever else needs to be after. So I think it's changed things um, in, in a number of ways that are helpful to all students and especially to students who might have some type of medical disability, personal issue um, or, or health issue that, that comes up. But uh, so I'll leave it there. Thank you. So uh, now, it, so hopefully, uh, I think 
can everyone start their video? Because I would love to have a discussion. Um, and uh, so I have two specific questions uh, and then a general question that I would love the panel to discuss. Um, so Danielle, I wonder if you'd be willing to share a handout template with anybody, uh, of the attendees who's interested. Um, I'm happy to send it out later, or uh, if you have a link, you can drop in the chat. Either way would be wonderful. Um, uh, absolutely happy to share. It's okay. uh, actually key to Molly's book for property. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and uh, I, I totally agree with you about the uh, sort of initial work on the front end and then the ease on the back end. Uh, and then uh, Portia, similarly, I'd be very interested in the, if you have a written version of the sort of invitation you have uh, to students. Um, and one of the things that I was struck in a recent book about first generation college students is that many of them misunderstood what office hours were. Uh, they actually thought uh, if you just listed office hours, that was when you didn't want to be bothered by students, um, which is just, uh, they just assumed that uh, and actually needed uh, specific instruction that this is when I want you to come talk to me. Um, and so I'm very interested in uh, the, the whether there's basically better language we can use to explain uh, what, what we want from them. And this gets me to the question I want to put to the panel, which is about a uh, concept of spoon feeding versus the idea of queuing, both of which came up with, it, Danielle described what she was doing in two ways. And I think the spoon feeding concept is a source of resistance to change among teachers, especially people you know like us who frankly were successful uh, in the pre in, in the system that didn't do a lot of scaffolding. Um, and so you know we we have we may have resistance or we may feel like uh, you know we should we got through it. Shouldn't other people also have to get through it? You know the uh, the question is what should be difficult about uh, difficult about law school, or you know to put it differently, what should be difficult about law school, and what can be made uh, simpler uh, without detracting from learning and perhaps even for enhancing it. So uh, I, I'd love to actually see if we can talk about this idea of spoon feeding uh, and. You know what? Uh, you know it, uh, what? If anything is too far, what is too little? Interesting thoughts there, and so I, I think um, I am very transparent with my students about why I teach the way I do, um, and and why I assign the materials I assign, and why I hold class the way I do. And I also had a session the first time now um, in the uh, beginning. Um, of the semester that was just, I think I had one or I had two sessions just on pedagogy, my teaching pedagogy, and would talk about um, materials, syllabus, exam, um, uh, class sessions, all of that. And so what I, I think spoon feeding might be more what some of our students might expect from some undergrad classes. It's if the book and materials are all lined up, only showing you what you need to know, already printed out. And so um, the test is there, the case is there, and it just has little, you know, boxes of exercises of how to apply it and um, is not, uh, and, and that your class is doing the same thing and the exam just has them mimic it. Um, and I think what, what, why I think that none of what any of us are doing is spoon feeding because I, I have yet to see materials um, that any law professor is using that look like this um, or a class set up like this is because I am still explaining to them I tell them do the reading once. And if it's confusing, you can go faster, right? And write down what your confusion is. Think if you have a reaction. I give them some questions um, at different points about what they can think about in doing the reading. And then I tell them with class, just engage with me and be there. Let's see what we're doing. I'm trying to do something in class and trying to have you um, start to understand what to pull from these cases um, and what to pull to, to figure out the questions to ask and try to derive from the material where we're going. So I do that and I'm still gonna do that in class. So I do not see giving them pointers of what to skim, what types of questions I'll be asking. Um, I don't see that as spoon feeding, nor do I see it as spoon feeding. Um, you know, so that's kind of the cueing, which I do do for some of the, the materials, um, of, cause there's no point to having them uh, trying to be memorizing different things that they don't need to memorize um, at all. But then um, telling them what tests are, uh, like what the standards are for different things um, afterwards, I also don't think is a problem because I'm very clear with them. I am extremely generous with points on the exam 
and there's meaning I, you will never have anything on there that doesn't get points. That also means you can never get all the points. Nobody is ever getting all of the points because I'm giving so many points. You can't do that at one point at, at, at one time. So, so I, I do think that it's hard no matter what, and nothing we do should be trying to make it more difficult. What could still feel difficult is them learning to think like a lawyer. And I can't take that from them, you know? So I tell them just sit with it and be okay with being uncomfortable and that you might not know something in a class and you might still be confused after class, but I'm here to help uh, clear up that confusion because I, I think we are paid to do that. So, you know, one thing that I hear is, uh, I think the something that holds people back, um, uh, especially in two and three L classes is, uh, you know, if I spend time on, th on this, then I lose time on substance. And, you know, shouldn't I be, you know, maximizing my time on substance, uh, especially in a two and three L class. Um, so, uh, Portia or, or if Sharon and Danielle have thoughts about, you know, how you achieve that balance. So, you know, I teach a pretty technical class, energy law, where we're sort of deep in the weeds of rate making and we're talking about principles of economics and, um, and the students sometimes feel like they've been thrown into the deep end. And I actually think a certain amount of that up to a point is good because they, you know, I give them the framing and the scaffolding to understand what we're talking about and why we're talking about it, right? So they don't feel like it's just gratuitous uh, challenge. So I like to start every class with learning outcomes for that class. And I usually have a substantive, one or more substantive learning outcomes and one or more skills-based learning outcomes for that class. So we might be doing a rate making simulation where the skill is understand how we price electricity and gas for utilities. Um, that's the substance. And then the skill is, you know, understand how to advocate in a rate making hearing, right? Your position. So I, I do that and then I tell them, I'm giving you some actual primary materials from a rate case. These are going to be challenging. These are going to be difficult to read. I am not expecting you to absorb everything in these materials. What I want you to do is, is very similar to Porsche, actually. I want you to sort of hit the highlights and then take notes and write down what you don't understand. And then actually couple that to sort of circle back around to the discussion about office hours and what they're there for. Um, this started for me before the pandemic, but I, I tell students repeatedly for the first month of classes, please come see me in office hours. I wanna know you, I wanna get to know you. You do not have to have a substantive question about the course. Um, and I ask them to come. But another thing I ask them to do in office hours as we move into the middle and back half of the course is to take all those questions from the reading to the extent they were not cleared up in class, just keep a running list, add to it as they go through and synthesize the materials, come into office hours and we'll just tick down the list, right? I do not want them to be sitting there um, in, a, in, a, in a state of confusion. Um, and so I think combining sort of the techniques for approaching the materials um, and that pedagogical scheme with the availability um, and access to talk through those materials with me. Um, it's something that I did before the pandemic, but I found students taking more advantage of it after we've had these more um, personal sometimes interactions during the pandemic and they've gotten used to seeing their teachers as resources as opposed to just a figure up at the front of the classroom expecting them to know everything in the reading of the material. I, I do some of the same thing. I also teach corporations, which is, uh, it's a 2L, 3L class. And corporations is a class that's on the bar. A lot of students feel like they have to take it. It's also where you tend to find a lot of the bottom of the class, if we're being honest. It's ex advanced private law. I reliably have half of the law review in it. And we have a lot of students in corporations who didn't enjoy the like theory discussions and the stuff that like I tend to love as a law professor. And I noticed in the pandemic that it took a lot more effort to really engage these students and, and draw them out because they were maybe the ones that were most likely to be like, I just want to get to graduation and practice. And so what I changed was I started to incorporate more material from the business school, actually. So they would get like real case studies and then give them the opportunity to work, to work in small groups, which I tended to shy away from in upper level classes, precisely because it takes so much time. And then I'm like, but I'm covering mergers and I want mergers to take two days and not four days. Um, but letting like meeting students where they are is something that I became much more aware of. And, and what I liked about some of the business school materials is that they are well scaffolded and they put students in primary documents. 
And for so many of at least the corporate law cases, I was like, oh, well, it turns out there is like a business component of this as well. And there was a way to engage a bigger swath of the class, including students who like are not enjoying law school and trying to bring them along and have them have like a positive educational experience. Right. And I think that really gets to the heart of, you know, a, a question about uh, what we're doing professionally. Right. So I think historically the re reaction has been kind of suck it up. Um, but a lot of these people are, in fact, going to end up being lawyers. So, uh, you know, our, uh, what, uh, how do we think about our, our duties to them? Um, you know, even if even if their uh, their attitudes maybe aren't, uh, you know, everything that we would have hoped for or everything that we can empathize with. Um, and, and anyone else want to share sort of tactics for uh, that uh, maybe helped disaffected students, you know, move, uh, you know, 10 percent closer to happiness or engagement? One of the real advantages, I think, of just having more dialogue and discussion with students and getting to know them a little bit more as individuals is you get to know of both what their background is, but also their hopes and dreams about the law. And that sounds a little corny, but I mean that in a very kind of technical way. I like with each student to find out not just what drives them um, substantively, like what they want to do with their time on the planet, but also which little pieces of law and legal practice do they find fun? Um, and I try to get to that with each student because I think, you know, and, and I try to offer a range of approaches and materials and styles in my class so that each student can, can hopefully find those corners. Because I do think when we're talking about long-term professional satisfaction, this is something I think we've all been thinking seriously about um, during the pandemic as well. And we're lucky enough to be law professors um, and it's just the, the best job in the world. But law practice can be difficult and challenging. It's like, how do we find joy in what we do and how do we shape a career that allows us to feel like we're doing something both meaningful and that we can continue to do that's sustainable over the long term. So, you know, whether we're doing a negotiation or whether we're doing, um, you know, a, um, a, 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 an auction, market auction, right? To turning a little bit more toward the business side of things. Um, and then talking through with the students what that looks like in practice and what the day-to-day -day is. I think, you know, that can be potentially very helpful to students as they start thinking about their careers while they're absorbing all of this material at the same time. think that, so I have been surprised that I think in some ways my students now compared to pre-pandemic are more like I was expected to be and was in law school, um, meaning that they are reaching out less. Um, they think that they're just supposed to get through it. Now, the weird thing is, um, like they have more professors who are more invested in teaching them the things and have thought more um, about the pedagogy connecting because we have the time and you know with increased time it's oh there's accessibility there's people learning in different ways and we're we're thinking about that more as instructors now so i i do now have um small group meetings in the beginning of the semester to talk with students over coffee um or whatever they you know, small beverage or snack um because that has made it and we talk about anything um, and that has made it so that they bring up some of those personal circumstances and feel more likely to tell me when something or or student affairs or something when something is coming up because what is what I would like to avoid and it's been strange how the pandemic has really helped us avoid it more is somebody not saying anything and then it getting to an awful point by the end whether it's awful with the class awful with some kind of plagiarism incident you know who know them thinking they shouldn't be in law school and so people have talked to me about those things much earlier um and we can have those conversations now about that i sometimes have with people much much later and in much worse situations of you're seeming like you're not loving it okay let me tell you second second year will be different let me also tell you there's some students who never love any part of this and they figure out how to they like their summers and they figure out how to do externships and they hold on for three years and they talk to their friends outside of law school, you know, to have some of those strategies up front to, to be more explicit um, with different things and understanding those students are in those different places. Some are really interested in theory, right? And, and, and that type of thing. You can talk to them about that, but you can also, I also say in class uh, or in the session after. So I was just explaining that you understand that I am not 
fan at all, personally, of that <laughs> model of thinking about things. But I want, if you hear it, to not be scared and for you to understand um, a few steps of that. You also never have to repeat that to me. Um, if you want to use something, you can talk about dignity instead of this, this specific economic approach, right? You, you have options. Uh, and, and really a lot tying many things to the idea, understanding the idea, practice and where it's helpful and what matters for practice what matters for exams, and often sometimes also a kind of what matters for clerking, right? Or if you're working for a judge or working underneath somebody. Um, I'm, I'm also giving lists of what to do and what not to do for students who want extra, because there's many um, who are asking for extra. They want to do more and they'll say, I, I really just wanna do well on the exam, or I really am more worried about learning, or I wanna go to practice in this area. So I just create lists of what to do in those things, in those areas and presenting the information oral in class, in small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, and written, I think is the only way to, to reach all of the students because some of them just won't hear it one way or another. So what would you say to a colleague who said, you know, this is just too much. Like if, if, if st somebody doesn't want to, you know, do the work, right, then, uh, then, you know, they're going to not be successful once they're out in the world without uh, uh, the professor prodding them to do this. And I'm interested in all of your reactions to that. I mean, I spent a more time in practice maybe than some of my colleagues did. And I tend to highlight that, like there, it was never the case that, that you would be like, okay, go write a brief about some stuff. Like you're, you tend to have like a pretty concrete assignment in practice. Um, and especially like in a corporate practice, you're often handed documents and you're like, make this deal like this prior deal, um, with these differences. And so I, my defense has typically been, I'm trying to actually make it more practice like, and it just also happens to map on what our colleague down in the next building on campus tells us is evidence-based. And I guess I would say I I expect a lot from my students. So I don't like to think of any of these techniques we've been describing as, um, you know, spoon feeding, right, was one sort of semi-derogatory term, dumbing down, right? Um, any of that. I like I liked the term scaffolding, right? But I but I like it because um, scaffolding is something that we put up to begin with and then pull away. And so our job as professors is to set them up for success in new activities analyzing a case in the first year, um, you know, reading through uh, the record in a regulatory proceeding, potentially in the second or third year, and then remove that scaffolding so that they're able to do that by themselves at the end of the year. And that to me is what a teacher does, is introduce you to new concepts and then give you the tools to approach those materials again in the future and right, to put together how to approach new types of materials, just for example, right, that you haven't seen before. So I don't think any, um, I can't speak for, for my colleagues, but I don't think that any of this is designed to be sort of the same all the way along. It's how to present material for the first time and then the students will learn themselves how to take on new challenges in practice. I actually found that by scaffolding up easy things like hard property vocabulary, I could then actually test and reliably get good responses on the more difficult questions and more difficult problems because I didn't have to spend exam time being like, did you learn what a future interest is? I think a part of it also is that I am not finding students who don't want to do the work. I'm not seeing any of them. They all want to do the work. And I, I think in our, they'll be doing a lot of work. It just is, I think it's part of our job to try to make sure they're doing the work smartly, right? Doing, doing smart work and efficient work. Um, as, a, as I told the student who was looking up every case that was mentioned in citation, like, I ordered you to stop. You know, please don't do that. Don't be reading every case that's, that's cited in anything I give you because that is not going to go well for you in terms of a use of your time uh, you, uh, and, and what it pays off in knowledge or in the class necessarily. So I think part of it is um, in us being teachers and getting where we have been, we likely are understanding something, hopefully, about how to learn and what's efficient. And so I think breaking down some of those things for students in terms of where to put their time they're putting is really helpful. Um, and, and I think, so I, I tell my students, um, 
uh, for example, who are very eager in, let's say, their first semester. Do not do other people's examples. Don't go through practices for them. That's not going to be worth your time. Um, and I tell them, I'll give you, you can, I'll give you practices that I, that I then review and talk with you about. Do all of those. Also, um, the practice exercises in the book that I cover, you can actually do those fully. That's going to be helpful. But don't, you know, and kind of specify where to do the work to do their work smartly. And I, I think another thing that, that we won't notice uh, that is a problem if we don't do more and continue to think of ways of, of doing more. Um, like me, it's not, sometimes it's also not more. I switch one session of office hours to a special session, right? <laughs> which, which is not different for me. <laughs> um, besides that I have 60 of my 74 students there at least. So they're, they're on it. Um, but if we don't do those types of things, what I was seeing when I didn't do that and before I sent that, you know, near midnight email um, is that students who already got it were the ones who were asking questions and other students by and large were not asking questions at all compared to what I had seen pre-pandemic. And I saw, I saw gender and sex um, implications for that. And I was seeing racial implications for that, et cetera, like many aspects of privilege. And that's not acceptable for me in my class. I am not going to have one particular demographic that is not getting it and others not. Um, so for me, changing things and saying them in different ways um, is, is helpful to, to address that as well. And I will tell you, I was nervous for the first time uh, with some of these things. And let's say, uh, for the first time having students uh, typing in the class or with computers. Um, I have zero issues. And I, I think part of it is because, and could I tell you who uses a computer and who doesn't? Not at all. And I've never had it be that the problem when I went to somebody um, and, and they didn't, uh, they weren't staying on top of it was that. And I've just taken a note and I kind of make sure I, I come back to that student a little bit more and they've never disappointed and just been checked out of the class. So I, I think there's there's something to, if there's a problem with students not doing the work, either we're not being specific about about which work is smart and will and will pay off in terms of learning, um, and I think it might be that if we're seeing some other issue, it might be something of how we've set up the class um, or how we're running sessions. I, I think could still be an issue instead of um, instead of student uh, effort or interest. So great, that was uh, very helpful. Um, so I have one more question, but before uh, I ask it and then ask for questions from the audience, uh, I wanna ask uh, the panelists, uh, anything that anybody else said that surprised you or that, uh, or, or that uh, heartened you? So we've already heard that, you know, a lot of experiences are similar. Um, anything stand out? Maybe I'll just be self-reflective here. I mean. Portia, so many of the things that you're saying do go um, sort of beyond um, what I've been doing in the classroom in the sense of, um, you know, talking to students about um, their own experiences outside the classroom and, and sort of various, various actual um, uh, um, activities and engagement exercises that you do. And so, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about is how much of our own experiences shaped us and how hard is it to change things. Um, and so we each had our own journeys in law school, um, even though they were all, I'm imagining the same law school based on how this program was organized. Um, but we, we each probably had very different experiences there. And I'm very much shaped by my experience in terms of the osmosis that you were talking about, um, Rebecca, and, and the teachers that I admire and the teachers that I wanted to emulate and a whole school of different styles, but, you know, sort of by and large, less of the um, additional work with students that we're talking about here today. And, um, and so, you know, one of the things I think is really crucial is that we all continue to get together and talk to each other. And I know there are a variety of, of fora for that. You know, the Clemenco program was a terrific place to talk about that. AALS has some good programs, you know, this program now and other programs so that we can hear what others are doing and think about how to incorporate that into our own, because it's, it's hard to invent this from scratch when what you have is your own example. Um, and so I think I'm just, I'm just grateful to hear from, from Portia and Danielle about what, what they've been doing and what's been working for them. Um, for me, and I, 
I should say also, I am, most of the things I'm talking about, nearly all, are for my first semester 1L students. That I think that's very different when you go to upper division in terms of the needs and the connections and support that they already have and the understanding they already have changes a lot. Um, I, I think, you know, something something along the lines of, uh, of, of something, uh, almost, I think maybe along the lines of, of um, the mention, I think Danielle mentioned about case studies from business school. I think I have pulled in things for my upper division or whatever you call them, electives um, from other types of schooling also that is helpful. So I, which actually takes more of the work off of me in a way. Um, and that is that for my, some of my seminars um, or smaller courses, I have people who, um, and even for some of my courses for, for remedies at points, I have um, for many of the sessions, discussion leaders um, who they work in the small groups and it can be two to four and they put together the queued up sheet in advance in a way, right? So they put together, they summarize some of the readings. Um, it also helps me to understand if they see what's going on, right? Or where the questions are, they put together questions um, and they lead a part of the discussion. So I think there are ways to also incorporate some of how people do things in, in grad school or in other areas that can ease up the time. Because for me, I will say it is shifting time. I think that I, I get called in with at least this much time on crises. Um, uh, at, at the end of somebody like sending in a paper, the not submitting a paper or sending in some other paper or something else, if I don't put in a little bit more time now. Um, for the for the first semester students, so I think some of it is just shifting time, because I I don't want to just put in more and more and more, and I don't think everybody should have to either. That shifting time point really resonates with me because it the problems can be so big at the end of the term, and especially I'm reliably at this point in my career like the youngest female faculty member any section has, which means I'm the section mom, whether or not I want that role, <laughs> um, and so it's if I don't sort of put up a slide that's like, this is where you get mental health help and this is where the academic services is, I'm gonna just do 10 meetings about that later. Um, and it's not that I don't want to talk to students about it, but I'll, I wanna talk to, I wanna talk to them about lots of things, not just that. Yeah, and actually one of the most uh, uh, helpful things uh, Georgetown never said to me when I was at Georgetown uh, was, uh, you know, you're not a counselor, right? Uh, like, uh, we don't want you trying to solve students' mental health problems, right? What we want you to do is, you know, raise a flag, like, uh, you know, uh, be a pathway by which that happens. But, but no, like, you know, uh, I do not have, uh, you know, I don't have any relevant degrees, you know, uh, and, and so knowing, you know, uh, knowing that, that you are there as a pathway, I think, uh, is really important. And it means like, it's not all emotional labor, right? Uh, right? And it's not all on you. Um, it, instead, you just have to have sort of situational awareness, including an awareness of, okay, you know, it's time for the Dean, right? Um, so uh, I, I just wanna call out something that, uh, that uh, was mentioned that I thought was very useful, it's specifically the idea of assigned roles um, which is a step beyond putting students on call. Um, and I think pedagogically quite productive, right? So on call, there's a lot of anxiety associated with it. One of the useful things about assigned roles is they actually offer sort of pre-existing scaffolding. Lots of teachers have worked on, you know, how you describe, you know, the, the, the question poser or the devil's advocate. And there are lots of written models out there. You can just adopt them. And then the student comes in with a much better idea of what they're going to do. And, it, you know, I think it's not spoon feeding because you're just saying, okay, these are the kinds of questions, right? But the student's job is to develop, okay, what would a devil's advocate say in this situation? Uh, and so I, I wanna just really emphasize that. Um, I was going to ask about actually videotaping uh, class because I have very strong opinions uh, about that, but uh, I, there are people with very strong counter opinions. So before uh, we do that, I wonder if there are any attendees who wanna pose a question, uh, please raise your hand. Um, if you have a specific question about uh, anything that we've talked about, 
Um, meanwhile, I suppose I will say, uh, so my, uh, while we're waiting for that, my very strong bias is video recording is great. You know, I have students who, uh, you know, whether they have health issues or whether, frankly, you know, they may have limited uh, oral English skills uh, and, you know, benefit from hearing something twice. So, you know, my view is you should have everything recorded and not require any, uh, any reason to access it. On the other hand, I teach, you know, intellectual property, which does not generally raise the kinds of issues that people get in substantial trouble for talking about, right? So I completely understand why the considerations may be different for criminal law, but uh, I'm, and there also may be concerns, you know, about controversy, about a student not wanting to talk if they're being recorded, um, about surveillance, but I'm interested in others' reactions to that. My classes are so large that I, um, in a hundred person or 120 person class, like I always have one or two ADA accommodations that require recording. So the recording is there. Um, I don't distribute the recording broadly for exactly the reasons Portia, discussed, Portia talked about that. Some students will uh, just use them unproductively and it's hard, it's hard to convince them that this is not a good use of their time, especially the first semester one else. I also limit it though, because property tends to bring up conversations that students won't have if the recording is broadly distributed. Um, I do have on my syllabus, though, a Vegas rule, which I call the Vegas rule, um, and where I explain that it's going to be a violation of the honor code to make any post on social media about any other student's participation in class unless they have permission. And that's because two years ago, we actually had warring vlogger, YouTube vloggers in class who were commenting on the gunners in class and and hitting, criticizing each other for views on hot topics and in very unsophisticated ways. And that it just, it ha even though you can cause it to not happen a second time after it happens once, once it happens once, nobody will talk in class. And even when these students who do have these YouTube channels are in other classes, like nobody will talk around them if the recording is public. And I think I, I, um, I have, recently had a student uh, who had a medical emergency in class. And for me, I would have felt so bad um, pre-pandemic when I didn't record every class to not be able to give students access to the recording um, if and when they could watch it. So, so I think recording everything makes complete sense and people can make choices as, as to when to give access. And I am, I, I am not saying that I'm in the right or that I will stay here in terms of not getting access to everybody um, off the bat, there might be problems with that. And I might need to change my wording some to make sure that students can know more that they can approach me um, uh, and not just have to go through accommodations if they might have a reason to want to be able to see more of the classes. So I think it's great. And I, I am taking this Vegas rule. I might be mentioning it to my students today um, as, as I rework the syllabus. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a, a far more traditional reason for, I, I do always have a recording. I always have at least one student with an accommodation and I like to have it in place anyway, um, in case there's a student with a sort of a medical excuse, um, sometimes for religious holidays and the like, but I don't distribute it broadly in part because, um, and this is just one semester, so maybe the N is too small to draw any substantive conclusions from it, but I, I had fewer students come to class. When, even with a even with an attendance policy in place when the recording was generally available and I do think there's a lot of power um, in having all the students or a, you know a critical mass of the students in the room it makes the discussion richer um, it ensures that I can be there to see you know wh where they're falling behind and where I need to help and support and I just think that's in, invaluable and that's actually one thing coming out of um, of our remote learning that I find so, so wonderful. I think we all do is being back in the classroom with the students and having that in-person relationship and dialogue. I mean, there are benefits to all of this remote technology that we have now. Um, but, but for me, maybe I'm old fashioned, like nothing replaces being in the room and having the conversations with the students. So I, I do worry based on that one semester's experience that, that unfettered access to videos will affect attendance. I, I think that that also goes to that question that's lurking around, like, what is the purpose of a university? And it's it's not necessarily a place for to be like an autodidact, like we're learning from each other. And so part of what we owe each other in a university is our presence and availability for discussion. And when too many people just opt to be 
like watching recordings and totally passive learners, it's maybe not the best thing for themselves, but they're also like denying their classmates the opportunity to learn from them. Well, uh, so that is, uh, I think, a perfect note on which to uh, to end this uh, recorded uh, uh, discussion. Um, and uh, I want to thank you again uh, for for being willing to start us off. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I think law teaching is changing. Uh, and I, I think HLS grads uh, can can be the, uh, kind of the 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 tip of the of the spear on the good kind of change, which I think is very much possible. So thank you so much. Uh, and if anyone's interested, uh, I'm happy to circulate uh, links to um, if if Danielle will share them. Uh, and also, if anyone's interested in the assigning roles, there is some really good uh, sort of there are some really good templates that people have. Uh, I'd be happy to send those around. So uh, please feel free to email me. Um, I'm very easy to Google. There aren't that many Tushnets out there. Uh, so uh, thank you again. Uh, and hopefully I will see some of you next time.